I'll be making the case for the 1986 Boston Celtics as the greatest basketball team of all time. Okay, Larry. Okay, Larry, show me something. Is this really the best team of all time? They told me Larry was the GOAT. I don't know if he's the GOAT, but I mean, he might, he might have snuck it to my top Some five. Some quick background. In the 1985 mm. NBA Finals, the Los Angeles Lakers defeated the Celtics behind the heroic efforts of Magic Johnson and Finals MVP Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. 85. It was the first time in history that the Lakers had defeated the Celtics in the Finals, going back as far as 1959. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that in the barely, the Celtics that, barely made key roster one? moves, licked their wounds, then rattled off a league-high 67 wins on their way to raising the franchise's 16th championship banner. Their 67 and 15 record stands as the best record in Celtics history, and their 15 and 3 playoff record serves as a testament to their aptitude on both ends of the court. Mm, they trotted okay. out the original Big Three of Robert Parrish. That a Big Three right there? You got Bird. You got Bird, Mikael, Parrish, Dennis Johnson, Danny Ainge. Bird, Mikael, and Parrish is a Big Three though. Is that the biggest Big Three of all? I don't know if that. That big three is the best big three ever. Maybe they got a big five. I don't know. Kevin McHale don't know. and the immortal Larry Bird. A dynamic like, like I like I know a lot of I know a lot of I know Mike is definitely the best player. Who the best twosome? Best twosome probably Shaq and Kobe. The best big three? Might be Magic Kareem and, and Worthy. I don't know that. They might have a case for the best five. I don't know that. Of Dennis Johnson and Danny Ainge. I don't know about Dennis. Johnson. boasted a talented bench anchored by former league MVP. I don't Bill know about Walton. Dennis Johnson and Danny Ainge. Now, before we go any further, I want to reach out to some of you out there. Some of you might be a little jaded about this team. And that's because some of the most prominent and influential figures in sports media were around for and swear by this team. You talking about your Bill Simmons, Simmons, your Jackie McMullins, your Bob Bryans. They all have a connection to this squad in some way or another. So the discourse around the 86 Celtics has always had a certain amount of Boston centric bias. I'm saying I want bias you to know, know that what. I have no such bias. I was born and raised in Kansas. I don't give a shit about Boston. Dunkin Donuts can go to hell as far as I'm concerned. And I'm here to tell you that just because those writers were a little bit biased doesn't mean that they're wrong. They not wrong. With that huh? said, where else do we start with the 86 Celtics than with Larry Bird? Hey man, look at that 1986 saw Bird take home his third straight MVP, joining the historic company of just Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell. Yeah, that's tough. Never that's before. The, that's probably like the first time they've seen somebody like Seen, seen somebody do it like that, huh? Had like, a forward uh, submitted a better season than Bird's seventh campaign. Like the Will era was like, I don't know, black and white. Seven and was desperately doing it live like, submitting yeah. a 50, 40, 90 season. The man Ooh. had a superlative basketball IQ and remains, for my money, the clutchest player to ever put leather through nylon. Hey. He had a blend of all around skills that began. Y'all saw, y'all saw Luca, y'all saw Luca game winner against the Celtics the other day against three people. I'm just saying. He's. Hey, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I saw it. Garnering him goat talk yeah. from people He's like Bob Cozy and Jerry West. His tenacity on the boards defied his 6'9 frame. His creativity was tantamount to Tesla. And his infectious passing gave the team an identity that remains as impressive and timeless now, some 35 years later, as it was back then. <clears throat> he finished the season ranked 7th in rebounds, 4th in points, 13th in assists, eighth in steals Ooh. and second in minutes played. So elevated was his level of play that he admitted to getting bored in games and looking for ways to entertain himself. That's a like step taking doing. increasingly ridiculous shots or playing portions of games left-handed. I gotta see that left-handed game. At the other That's forward a step spot doing here. was Kevin McHale. After you play against like the Cavaliers and you're like, ah, how are we gonna beat them? Let's see if we can come back if we get down by 10 in the fourth. For back-to-back -back six man <laughs> of the year awards around. as a super sub, 86 was McHale's first season as a starter, and he immediately began producing at an all-NBA level. Okay. With his 6'10 height and unsettlingly long limbs, McHale Ooh. earned a reputation as one of the great two-way players in the league. Defensively, he was mobile and springy enough to move with quicker swingmen while being long and strong enough to contest interior scores. 
offensive okay, line, there's a reason that Elijah Wan and Mikhail are the two names that get mentioned whenever someone talks about post players. Ooh, ooh. In Mikhail's oh my chamber, God. Were subjected Kevin McHale? To an array of moves that left them confounded. Wondering That's where quickness on too. Earth the man on. went and how the hell he'd gotten there. You never knew what he was going to throw at you. He'd combine fakes into an up and oh under, my God. Pivot okay. into an uncontestable fall away, or whatever else struck his fancy. It's still striking to see him twist and wind through defenders with his okay, moves the move. same way Kyrie Irving splits defenders with his handle. I don't know if you Averaging Kyrie 21 up. points and 8 rebounds a game on an otherworldly 57% field goal percentage, Mikhail was a luxury for Boston. <laughs> he would take that's on a, the that's toughest that. defense. Mikhail literally that old man in the, in the YMCA, man. You're like, man, how is this man doing that, bruh? He got some quick post moves, and he just, just killing you in the, in, in the interior. Like, man, you got these these young boys out here guarding, guarding out here, dribble, dribble, trying to be Kyrie and Michael Jordan. And then this old man in the post got all the points. Defensive assignment, in allowing post. Bird to roam, and scored with enough efficiency and volume that his counterpart never had to carry the full offensive burden. Rounding out the big three was the man in the middle, the chief, Robert Parrish. Okay. As the unsung hero of the team, Parrish doesn't get talked really about nice. nearly as much as Bird and McHale, but make no mistake, Chief was dangerous. Keeping in mind that these stats don't include Bill Russell because of a lack of recorded statistics, Parrish is still the Celtics' all-time leader in offensive rebounds, defensive rebounds, mm. blocks, mm. and is still the NBA's leader in games played. He looked like he rely on Chief for 16 and 10 with Duncan like Bill consistency. Russell. <laughs> the man was always in shape and feasted on opposing defenses simply by outrunning them. No, okay. God only knows okay, how many points he scored because he hustled his way down the court, setting up easy outlet passes. He shot well from the field, was a good free throw shooter, had a reliable jumper, defended, rebounded, reliable set jump. Steven Adams-like picks, and did all the little things. There wasn't a ton of room for heroics on such a loaded roster, so you couldn't count on Parrish jumping out at you with a 39-point game, but he embraced being the third option the same way Scottie Pippen embraced being the second. Okay, I thought you'd say... Never forget I that Robert say, Parrish Pippen held his option. own in the age of giants against Ralph Sampson, Elijuwon, Kareem, Moses, this Ewing, some, and the rest of them. This dude got some Alonzo Mourning to him. was Dennis Johnson, one of the most underrated players ever. That's really? a video for another time, though. For the Celtics, DJ fulfilled his role as the best defensive guard of his era. With nine straight all-defensive selections from 79 to 87, Ooh. only Kobe made more all-defensive teams as a guard. Okay, he was the you best matchup Ron on Harper Magic going, okay. any player in the league, set the table for everyone on his team, and consistently came through in money time. Okay, so you big shot Bob, not he big shot Bob. Uh, some refer to as a... What's uh, uh, Chauncey Billups? Telepathic Big connection. What they call? What they, what they call? Chauncey Billups. Between them, routine. He was the ringleader of the squad, and Ooh. Bird still calls him the best player he ever played with. Missed the big shot. That At the other guard was Danny Ainge, a reliable double-digit scorer and wily little rascal that thrived on wily little up rascal. the opposition and getting under their skin. You don't Ainge throw the ball at me. Come on now. The great shooters of the era and went on to demolish the single-season three-point record in 1988. Really a talented multi-sport athlete. Ainge remains the only high schooler to be named a first-team All-American in football, baseball, and basketball. Yo. And coming off the bench, hey, ain't nobody doing that these days. I promise you, ain't no two-sport athletes. So to be a three, no, he think he uh, Anthony Edwards. He think he a three-sport athlete. He said he could play baseball, he could play football, and he could play basketball. But I saw Anthony Edwards throw a pitch. Nah, ain't no. The last one to do that was like what Bo Jackson. They ain't doing that no more. Bench was the Celtics' uh -uh. secret weapon, Bill Walton. Drafted first overall by the Portland oh, yeah. Trailblazers in 1974, oh. okay. Walton had jump. a transcendent stretch of basketball in the late but 70s, guiding the Blazers to the NBA championship in 77 and winning league MVP in 78. Ooh. Injuries derailed his career at the end of his 78 season. Oh. Though, he played in just 14 games over the next four seasons. Oh. By 86, Walton was a liability and a shell of the player he once was. Oh. Looking for redemption and one more chance to be a part of something special, he called Red Arback to see if the Celtics would be interested in trading for him. I'm about to say, I heard the man name before, like he was nice, but... 
Every time I see some Celtics footage, he on the bench. <laughs> so I'm like, what? It was he really that nice or so? He was done Owen by Drew, okay. He was done by the time he got still to still remained the biggest question on everyone's mind. Could his body withstand the grueling championship campaign these Celtics were setting out on? Mm -mm. Well, in the 100 games that the Celtics played that season, Walton played in 96 of them. He won the sixth man of the year award thanks to his really? size, smarts, rebounding ability, and defensive instincts. Oh. He was still every bit of the best passing big man ever oh. and found a kindred spirit in Bird who also reveled in elevating the talent level of his teammates and in okay. the fine details of basketball. Okay. To boot, Walton added an Andy Bernard okay. dynamic to the team. He had had Funny. his good old days and seen them drain through his fingers. Mm. Yet here he was, once again, with a chance to be a part of something historic, completely. So you need those type of people on the team too. Those, those along with the glue guys, you need some old vets who just want, just win, who just want to win. They didn't got had the glory days. They just want to win, and you need some glue guys that just know they, you know, what I'm saying, know their role, know their position, man. Completely aware and appreciative of the fact that this was and would always be the good old days of Celtics basketball. <laughs> In all, the roster touted five Hall of Famers. Five. Five. Oh. So out of them six people you named, McKay Bird, that one, Mikhail, Robert Parrish, Danny Ainge, Dennis Johnson, and Bill Walton. You mean to tell me one of those is not a Hall of Famer? Okay. Whole lineup. Which one? And every starter on the team was a double-digit score. They gelled together to form a hive mind presence, assimilating into nothing short of Bird's brainchild. Mm. If Bird were cutting, DJ would put the ball where it was supposed to be the second it was supposed to be there. Mm. If Mikhail was rolling on some poor soul in the post and got doubled, Ainge would be in the perfect place for a kick out. If Parrish got open down the court, you could bet that the ball would find him. Emulating Bird's all around prowess, the Celtics could beat you in any which way. Mm -hmm. Whatever you did, they did better. If you so, if Bird got all these Hall of Famers on his team, don't that hurt his case for being the greatest player of all time? That hurts his goat case because you're saying his team was that good. I don't know. I'm just you had a I'm speedy just, I'm just heading out guard. Out. You had know. the pleasure of being locked down by Dennis Johnson. Locked if down. your calling card was your big men. You had to contend with the greatest front court of all time. Not razor sharp defensively, the hive mind will beat you into a pulp with their passing. Mm. Your offense isn't clicking on every conceivable cylinder. You would be swarmed, you would turn the ball over, and every shot you took would be smothered. And if you oh, let yeah, the game means... stay close down the stretch, Larry Bird would put the nails in your coffin. That's a good team. They had answers for everything. They could change their style of play on a whim. That's a good team out. right there. Bird, Ainge, and backup point guard Jerry Seasting were all dead-eye shooters. The big men were some of the best post players to ever play. You might have some about being a great team. Absolutely Greatest massive team. lineup with Bird at the two, Mikhail at the three, and Parrish and Walton in the middle. They could go small with no loss of quality with Mikhail at center and Bird at the four. Ooh. Craziest of all, they really wouldn't even need to size up or size down. The 86 Celtics are still one of the only teams in history to be able to play a small ball style with a gargantuan starting lineup. Goodness gracious. Everyone was mobile enough to push the pace and stay active. Their inside-outside performance. Now that's a good, now that's a two-on-one fast break for you right there. Pace and stay active. <laughs> two-on-one. Now that's a Their classic two-on-one fast break. Space the floor. They could defend and corral nearly all types of scorers and their mm. passing would carve defenses to shreds all without giving up an inch. Oh my gosh. And if we're checking boxes, Man, run a zone. the Boston Garden in the 1980s <laughs> was well, the no, best home run court three, two. sports. You got those some different at these Already boys. some 50 years old, the dingy dungeon halls of the Garden had been host to some of the greatest players and moments in sports history, offering comfort to its allies and peril to its enemies. Somebody could have the figured crowd out was that. insatiable and earned a reputation for both their devotion and potential for viciousness. The rafters were littered with championship banners and retired numbers in such quantity that they became superfluous. 
The Celtics took advantage of this and ran with it, notching a 50-1 home record, including the playoffs. Were they perfect perfect? No, they weren't that athletic, and they had a tendency every now and then to get bored and take their foot off the gas against bad teams. Uh, yeah, Could he, they have gotten to 70 quantify. or even 72 wins? Sure, and you can hold that against them, but tell me, when we're talking about something as grand as the greatest team of all time, how much do those three to five regular season games really matter? You're right. You're right. As we established. Because uh, the Warriors was out here going for the record. And they got, what, 73 and 9? By the playoffs, they was like, ah, we, we need somebody clutch. We need a clutch factor player. And they, they got LeBron. So, um, those three games, I don't know. No, no it was like five games. It was like five, five, six games, something like that. I don't know if they mean that much. In the beginning of the know. video, the Celtics lost the 85 finals to the Lakers for the first time in franchise history. The loss stung deep, and members of the team still believe that they let the series get away from them. With a newfound inspiration and the drive to reclaim what they believed was theirs, they mm -hmm. tore through the league with one team in mind. Just the, the Lakers. rivalry between the Celtics and the Lakers <laughs> should need no background. Since the days of Jerry West and Elgin Baylor competing against Bill Russell and Bob Cousy, the two franchises have defined the NBA within and without. Today, the two franchises account for nearly half of all championships in NBA history. Anything is possible! And the rivalry was never more intense than in the 80s, as Magic Johnson and Larry Bird presented their teams and their sport to the world. Since their iconic college basketball championship showdown, the two had assumed the role as battling titans, trading blows with one another, daring to push the boundaries of basketball to fit their <laughs> own needs and desires. No pass was too extraordinary, no shot too outrageous. And after the Lakers had landed such a damaging blow in the finals, Bird and the Celtics were eager to return the favor. In the two regular season matchups between the two squads, the Celtics came away with victories both times against the defending champs. And while they no doubt enjoyed the bragging rights that this afforded them, their true crusade began in the playoffs. Give me them finals In wins. round one, they found themselves matched up with the 40-win Chicago Bulls and an extraordinary young guard named Michael Jordan. Having missed wins. most of the season with an injured foot, Jordan was eager wins. to assert himself and unleash his latent talent. 40 wins and you in the playoffs? Just that. After a 49-point performance in game one, Jordan put on a spectacle in Game 2 by setting the NBA record for most points in a single playoff game with 63. Oh Bird goodness. famously described the effort as God Jesus. disguised as Michael Jordan. God disguised as Michael Jordan. It was the future of the NBA and a coming out party for the well, league's Bird next great star. Ultimately for the series, though, it didn't even matter. The Celtics won both games. Not even such an extraordinary performance as Jordan's was enough to dent the armor of the Celtics, who then won game three to sweep the series. And mm. after killing God, <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> in the next round, Boston was faced with MVP runner-up and the league's leading scorer, Dominique Wilkins, and his Atlanta Hawks. Oh, Though the Celtics out here. had won all four of the regular season matchups with the Hawks, each contest was decided in the single digits, and most had come down to the final moments. But you got Bird Dominique on your team. represented Bird's toughest matchup in the East, with his boundless athleticism and potential for incredible outbursts. The Celtics succeeded in containing him for the most part, though, putting up walls to the lane and closing out on his jump shots. Though they were competitive through the first three games, the Hawks were at the mercy of the Celtics and found themselves down three games to nil. With game four in Atlanta and a series victory for Boston all but certain, Wilkins and backup point guard Spud Webb caught the Celtics with their foot off the gas, combining for 58 points and denying them a four-game sweep. That's real convenient. Real convenient. These are... You can't really determine how much of it is taking your foot off the gas, man. These are not quantitative things. They took their foot off the gas... That's a convenient excuse. Back in Beantown for Game 5, Bird and company took the opportunity to remind the Hawks, themselves, and the league that this oh, was their hey, year. Speaking. In one of the great statement games in playoff history, Boston turned an 11-point halftime lead into a 33-point blowout, punctuated oh. by an absurd third quarter in which the Celtics outscored the Hawks 36-6. Defense oh. turned into offense. Offense turned into more offense. 
and by the oh. end of the period, the crowd was bursting with supreme confidence in their team. Oh, okay, okay. Beat LA, a. Hey. Beat LA, okay, okay. Ooh, I got just got, I just got chills. The Celtics were a team of destiny, and the Garden knew it. We will not be denied. Okay. Austin then easily I, dispatched. I get you taking the foot off the gas. Bucks I get out. The Eastern Conference Finals. <laughs> Though in fairness, the next Cindy Moncrief had sustained a hobbling foot injury earlier in the playoffs. He missed game one and was ultimately held in check by the Celtics, who took the series in four games. Would a healthy Moncrief had made a difference? Unquestionably. Would the Celtics have swept the Bucks? I think it's unlikely. But would they still have won the series and advanced to their third straight finals? Probably. Yes. Yes, definitely yes. In any yes. case, the Celtics were now four wins away from capturing their championship and submitting their application to the all-time team discussion. Okay. All they needed was a worthy opponent. And they got one, though it wasn't the one they were expecting. That's because the defending champion Lakers had been upset in just five games. Oh! And, the and their mammoth combination of big men. Seven. Bruh, that's like when uh, LeBron was supposed to go up against Kobe that year. When they had all them dog commercials. Yeah, Kobe. And he was supposed to go against LeBron. LeBron and got upset by Dwight Howard and the Lakers. Man, you out here messing up the story, Lakers. What y'all doing? Or Ralph Sampson and seven-foot Akeem Olajuwon. And they intended to prove that their victory over the Lakers had been no fluke. After two Celtic victories in Boston... The series moved to Houston for the next three games. Mm. Here, the Rockets put their foot down and showed a resilience not yet seen against these Celtics, Ooh. earning the respect of the basketball-watching public. They won game three by two points, helped in large part to Sampson's 24-point, 22-rebound performance. Okay, so Still the against the ropes, here, though, they faltered early, huh? in game four, suffering a three-point defeat. With a 3-1 series lead through the first four games, the Celtics were on the brink of their destiny. They'd been able to mitigate the Rockets' size advantage on the boards, though the 23-year-old Elijah Wan had succeeded in making himself known as an intimidating and impressive young talent. Young boy, with okay. Boston looking to close out their season with a championship in Game 5, Elijah Wan played an inspired game with 34 mm. points, 14 rebounds, and 8 blocks. Mm. The Rockets won and ensured that no championship would be hoisted on Houston's home floor, but not before damning their championship chances. Hey man, that's respected. Just into the Hakeem. second quarter, young, young game, Hakeem, Sampson had gotten a mismatch on six-one Jerry Seesting. After some pushing and jostling for position, Sampson turned around and delivered two quick, heavy blows to Seesting, oh. igniting a bench-clearing altercation. Oh my God! Sampson was subsequently <laughs> ejected from the game, though Elijah Wan did carry the Rockets to a victory and forced a trip back to Boston. The Celtics were pissed. Dude's just out here throwing blows like that? Hold up. Hold up. He threw haymaker after haymaker. Quick, heavy blows. I ain't banked this man. Bro, the Celtics must have been doing something. They must have been talking. Ca oh, yeah. Barry, one of the greatest trash talkers of all time, huh? They must have been talking cash trash. Because it's not the first time I've seen them. They just want to foul off on these Celtics. Igniting Look at that. a bench clearing Ooh. altercation. Doom, doom. Come on. Samson he just was stole a haymaker. Ejected from the game. Though Elijah Wan did carry <laughs> the Rockets to a victory and forced a trip back to Boston, the, was be talking. the Celtics were pissed. They were pissed crazy. that they'd let that game get away from them. They were pissed that they'd let Houston keep the series alive. And they were pissed that Samson had squared off against a player over whom he had a 15-inch height advantage. At practice the day before Game 6, the players worked themselves into such a feverish lather, playing with so much physicality, that head coach Casey Jones had to call off practice the garden was no different. The Ooh. fans were delirious, setting oh, a new nah. kind of record for malevolent oh, trash talk nah. with most of their attention focused on the imposing Rockets oh, center. Nah. The team and their oh, fans nah. wanted to win, to claim Boston their rightful different. place at the height of the sport, and they wanted to make the Rockets regret the day they ever messed with the Boston Celtics. And the instrument for that righteous fury was none other than Larry Bird. <laughs> For one game, Larry Bird played a different sport in what has been described and immortalized in many different ways as the greatest game he ever played. Really? At first you glance, know? you notice his box score wasn't all that sensational. 29 points, 11 rebounds, 12 assists on 47% shooting. He didn't score 60, 
it wasn't a near quadruple double, and he hit no buzzer beaters. But you only have to watch the game to see that he was, in classic bird fashion, everywhere, doing everything at all times. Mm, Disrupting passing tough. lanes, finding his teammates, even winning a jump ball against Elijah Wan. Ooh. He was the king, and basketball was his kingdom. The Celtics walked yeah. out with a comfortable 17-point victory as world yeah. champions. Okay. With Bird remarking himself that it was okay. the best performance of his career. I the that. only one that he ever felt totally prepared for. I get that. Afterwards, Red Arback blessed the team as one of, if not the, greatest he'd ever seen. To recap, you take one of the most talented starting fives ever, composed of the greatest front court of all time, mm -hmm. with the greatest forward tandem to ever play basketball, mm -hmm. and watch them eviscerate their opponents mm -hmm. with stifling two-way play, dazzling yeah. passes, suffocating defense, exquisite shooting, and sublime post play. Mm. They win more. You know what's even better? The fact that they're the togetherness, they have the willingness to fight for one another. That usually takes the team from being, you know what I'm saying? You're looking at them on paper, their stats can be like this. But when they work together and willing to fight for each other, it takes them to another level. So you might have a case right there. More games than have ever been won by their illustrious club and proceed to rampage their way to a championship culminating in the best game in the career of one of basketball's most brilliant talents. The Boston Garden stands no more. Demolished in 1998 after 70 years of service and replaced with a building with air conditioning. <laughs> I'll never get to see it. Never get to ask the walls my questions, nor gag down a Sam Adams surrounded by insufferable Boston sports fans. Mm. That's like Among the distinguished teams that called the parquet floor home, one stands alone. It's like these rowdy high school. If those walls were still around, if that floor could talk, I know what I'd ask them. And I think I already know the answer they'd give. They'd tell me that the 1986 Boston Celtics were the greatest basketball team of all time. Mmm. You might have me on that one.